Is current thinking around PPE bad for hospital staff safety? Thank you, Ruth, for your kind introduction. I would like to start this talk by acknowledging the Yungabir people, the traditional owners of the land on which I am making this recording. I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. When we set about putting this presentation together earlier in the year, we were troubled by two messages that we were repeatedly hearing in the press in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. Firstly, that this was the first time in over 100 years that we had faced such a potential threat. And secondly, that PPE is the cure for everything. Let's just get more PPE. And neither of these messages are accurate. This prompted us to ask the question, is the current thinking around PPE good or bad for hospital staff safety, for you and for me? To answer this question, we're going to look at the history of both the, this COVID pandemic and other pandemics. We will concentrate on what lessons were not learned and put into practice, what we need to do better today. We will also look at definitions of PPE in different countries and use the hierarchy of controls to define the rightful place of PPE. We will do this through two scenarios, respiratory hazards and sharps hazards. This will unblock our thought processes and plans for constructing a safer future for both staff and for patients. We will use three thought experiments to make the session at least virtually interactive. Let's start by looking at what has happened as a result of the situation where PPE was one of the most immediate responses to this health crisis. As you can see from this timeline, the COVID-19 outbreak was officially identified in December 2019, with the first human case being reported. In March of 2020, the World Health Organization officially declared it a pandemic, meaning that this epidemic infectious disease had now spread across multiple continents. Six months later, one million deaths were reported. At the time of this recording, in July 2021, 185 million infections and 4 million deaths have been recorded and both of these figures are believed to be gross underestimates. The first highly visible response by governments and hospitals to the COVID pandemic was the increased use of PPE, in particular gloves, gowns and masks. Practically, this initial response was designed to reduce the spread of COVID both within the hospital and the community. Another reason was the early focus on PPE was that it was easy to implement rapidly until, of course, the stocks ran out. And in theory, they were supposed to act as a stopgap measure to buy time for more effective control measures to be introduced. However, what the general population heard was PPE is the be all and end all for staff safety. They were not educated about the need for more effective control measures to be implemented as soon as possible and the fact that preventative measures should have been implemented prior to the outbreak. The first issue with the heavy focus on PPE was that the inconsistent definitions being used. As you can see from this map of the world, while the definitions across different regions are similar, they are not the same. In the USA, PPE is limited to those items that can be worn. In Europe and Australia, the definition is a bit more liberal with the inclusion of items being worn or held in Europe and items being used or worn in Australia. Now, while these changes might look small on the surface, the lack of universal standardisation across different countries can lead to unnecessary confusion for what was and still is a global pandemic. This global problem requires global solutions and that requires clear, consistent, transparent and harmonised communications. I'm also very concerned that the safety devices and practices not included in these definitions seem to have been ignored. So the media's message that PPE is the be all and end all of staff safety is wrong and potentially detrimental to staff safety. Fortunately, in most, if not all parts of the world, the focus on more effective means of reducing safety hazards is increasing, but still has a long way to go. 
This talk aims to focus your attention and actions on this. The second issue with the heavy focus on PPE is that as a result of the pandemic, the global demand for PPE exploded within healthcare, the general public and most other industries. Very quickly, demand outstripped supply, resulting in soaring costs, low quality and even fake certified products being purchased, with large sections of healthcare staff being left unprotected or poorly protected. One report noted that in April 2020, the cost of N95 masks peaked at a price 150 times higher than the pre-pandemic costs. Do you remember being shocked at how much masks in your local pharmacies had risen to? The price gouging was happening at multiple levels in the broken supply chains. So we know that this initial pandemic response, focusing so much attention on the provision of PPE, resulted in a lot of serious consequences. Let's look at what the current and short-term effects of that decision have been. How have hospital budgets been impacted? As you can see from this slide, hospital budgets have suffered a double whammy during the pandemic. Firstly, dramatically increased costs. Both the quantity and cost of PPE have increased. The price of PPE may be returning to normal, but the volume being used is still much higher than pre-pandemic levels. The initial surge of patients with serious infection led to a surge of ICU admissions overwhelming the original bed numbers, requiring more beds and the purchase of more, more expensive equipment, such as new ventilators and cardiac monitors. The increased reliance on locum staff have also cost the hospital a premium. Secondly, revenue has dropped significantly, with elective surgery being cancelled during the variable periods of lockdown. Estimates are that the lost revenue is between $53 and $122 billion in the US alone. And this does not take into account the cost to patients resulting from delayed diagnosis and delayed or cancelled surgery, nor the cost to staff from infection to fatigue and mental distress. This reactionary focus on PPE has been both inadequate and expensive. Once again, we can see that medium and long-term investment in prevention would have saved money in the long run. I would now like to pause for a moment with the first of our three thought experiments. I would like you to spend a few moments, hit pause if you need longer, and consider how you think these immediate impacts on hospitals, staff and patients could have been minimised. What could governments have done differently? What could your hospital have done differently? Is there anything that you personally could have done or done differently? Throughout the rest of this talk, we will reflect on the answers to these questions. I think we can all agree that our responses to this pandemic were not perfect, largely because the lessons that we should have learned from previous pandemics and epidemics were ignored. So now is the right time to learn from the successes and failures in the response to this current pandemic and see how we can better prepare for the inevitable future epidemics and pandemics. I'll repeat that the media message that we often heard, namely that we have not experienced a pandemic like this one for over 100 years, not since the Spanish flu killed 100 million people. Let's go back 40 years to the HIV AIDS pandemic that has killed at least 32.7 million people. The first cases in healthcare workers were, were reported in 1985, but it was 15 years before the first law to protect staff was passed in the USA, namely the 2000 Needlestick Safety and Prevention Act. In Europe, it was a total of 28 years before similar legislation to protect healthcare workers from sharps injuries was passed by member countries. And 36 years later, Australia still doesn't have equivalent legislation to protect staff from sharps injuries. For those of you who are lucky enough not to be old enough to remember the early days of the HIV pandemic, I can tell you that the amount of fear and even hysteria at that time was very similar to what we have experienced recently, with the exception that there was no shortages of toilet paper. Now, let's go back less than 20 years to the SARS epidemic that was also caused by coronavirus. 
did we really learn the lessons that we were being taught? Research groups that were working on a vaccine against coronavirus during SARS had their funding cut when normality was restored. This meant that their research was shelved, a great example of how not to plan for a safer future. As you can see on this slide, we have had plenty of opportunity to learn and implement strategies to protect clinical staff from hazards, including those resulting from bloodborne and respiratory infections. So why were we so underprepared? To put it nicely, the evidence strongly suggests that it is very likely to be something other than a lack of knowledge. At a national level, politics would appear to have played a big role, and I don't mean that in any partisan way. Short-term political focus on budgets and the next election makes it difficult to invest in preventative strategies, even when there is good evidence that this will lead to money being saved in the medium to long term. In the US, the UK and many other Western countries, funding cuts were made to biosurveillance and public health, with focus being shifted to more tangible threats, such, such as national security. At an organisational level, training for public health emergency preparedness and response was grossly underdone. There remains a short-term focus on balancing budgets and patient safety. Staff safety remains a poor second cousin in their priorities, especially when it comes to resource allocation. And historically, we have just accepted this. Organisations have taken a silent bet in preparing for likely events and hoping that the unlikely ones won't occur, at least not on their watch. Obviously, this was not a winning bet. At an individual level, there is a lot of denial, which is understandable with many staff, especially the younger ones, having no personal experience with similar pandemic events, or more accurately, no personal experience with friends and colleagues dying during those pandemics. And as you will be able to testify, your day job is so busy, it feels like there is no time free for you to spend training for remote events that may never occur. So not learning from the past and relying too heavily on PPE has led to the following consequences. Firstly, hospitals have not focused on more effective prevention strategies. Planned strategies to prevent respiratory infections should have included measures such as the better use of ventilation systems, including negative pressure operating rooms and patient rooms, and the routine installation of surgical smoke evacuation systems in every OR. How many of you work in hospitals that have an adequate number of negative pressure ventilation operating rooms? Other occupational risks seem to have been ignored. In fact, sharp injuries among nurses have increased. The Royal College of Nurses in the United Kingdom found that sharp injuries amongst nurses increased in 2020 by 50% compared to 2008. They noted that the reasons included increased staff pressure and fatigue, as well as lack of access to safer sharps and appropriate training and education. Along with this, staff safety culture was impacted. Fatigue increased and wellness decreased. If there is one thing I would like you to remember from this talk, it is that in the response to the financial impact of the pandemic, the hard fought staff safety initiatives cannot be eroded. They need to be strengthened and increased. This needs to be done hand in hand with continued improvement in patient safety. Our goal must be one safe culture for all of us. Okay, so what are we going to do better this time? we need to undertake a systematic approach to prevention rather than an ad hoc reactive approach. And we need to audit that both the actions are actually being undertaken as well as the desired results are being achieved. We will now look at how to implement a systematic approach to prevention in order to avoid the negative impacts we have experienced when the response was limited to PPE. To start with, how can we ensure that more effective control measures are implemented at the right time to prevent current and future respiratory infections? 
The hierarchy of controls provides us with an effective framework to identify where more effective control measures can be implemented in hospitals to look at prevention in a systematic way. The hierarchy of controls dates back to 1950 when they were developed by the National Safety Council in America. They took an upside down approach to the behaviour based safety programs that ignored hazards and risks and focused on critical workers' behaviours. The old way of dealing with staff safety relied heavily on elaborate mechanisms to check, inspect, observe, coach, reward, and even discipline workers. Does that still ring a bell? Over the last 70 years, the hierarchy of controls has been standardised across most industries to reduce risk in a systematic, system-wide manner. Healthcare is finally reviewing and adopting this proven approach. Use of the hierarchy of controls is now recommended by many globally respected institutions in healthcare, including but not limited to the World Health Organization, the Center for Disease Control, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, and AORN in the US, the NHS in the UK, and in European Council Directors, as well as Safe Work Australia, to name but a few. The hierarchy of controls is divided into five levels, elimination, substitution, engineering controls, administrative controls, and then personal protective equipment. It provides you with a structured and simple way to analyze and manage any occupational risk. Let me present the details on how these different levels can be applied to prevent the risks of respiratory infections, both in normal times and during future pandemics, like the COVID one we are in now. Elimination or removal of the hazard, in this case, people infected with COVID, is obviously the best way of reducing infections to staff and other patients. This can be achieved in a variety of ways, including keeping the virus out of the normal hospital wards. This would involve not admitting COVID infected patients with minor symptoms and admitting sicker patients to special wards where they can receive optimal medical care, but where they will be safely isolated from staff and other patients. Keeping visitor numbers to an absolute minimum. Quarantining staff if they are exposed to infected patients. Another way is using telehealth when practical. Substitution or replacement of the hazard with a safer alternative is another excellent way of reducing respiratory infections. Examples include using video laryngoscopy for intubations. This allows extra distance between the anaesthetist and anaesthetic nurse and a patient's nasopharyngeal secretions. Using spaces instead of nebulizers when treating asthmatic patients with ventilin. However, rarely are elimination and substitution strategies practically sufficient to protect staff from the hazard. This is when the next level, which is engineering controls, plays a significant role. Engineering controls are designed to further protect people from the hazard by creating a change to the worker's environment. As you will see from the following examples, engineering controls cover a wide range of solutions from the original hospital design to expensive capital equipment and to less expensive disposable safety devices. Examples include negative pressure operating theatres with HEPA filters and external exhaust systems and negative pressure patient cubicles. Preferably as permanent builds, but they can also be provided as temporary or portable solutions. Smoke evacuation systems or vacuum shrouds. Physical barriers and dedicated pathways to guide symptomatic patients through triage areas. And plexiglass screens at receptions. Also hands-free bins, soap dispensers and door openers. The next step is administrative controls. Administrative controls are essentially there to ensure that staff change the way they work and that they actually implement the hierarchy of control solutions that were agreed upon. They include education and training on prevention policies and the correct use of PPE, the DONs and DOFs. Written policies for social distancing. Signage is another example. For example, on where to stand, 
on, on how to perform hand hygiene correctly, reviewing disinfection practices, especially in patient use areas, updating work schedules for staff arrival and departure to reduce physical congestion at those times and during meal breaks, etc. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, is probably the most universally identified way of keeping staff safe. However, it sits at the bottom of the upside down pyramid for a reason. It is the least effective way of protecting staff from respiratory infections. Examples of PPE include N95 masks with correct fit testing, surgical masks, eye protections, gloves and gowns. But as one answer to the question posed in the title to this talk, PPE is the option of last resort, the last line of defence. The first four levels need to be given greater importance and need to be implemented in conjunction with PPE, not replaced by PPE. As you can see from this section, the more effective protective measures to prevent respiratory infections to healthcare workers and other hospital staff had not been correctly planned for, and as a result, had not been implemented before this predicted pandemic hit. We will now look at the second systematic approach to how to prevent the same devastation with the next pandemic. Other occupational risks should never be ignored, not even when we are heavily focused on preventing respiratory infections. Safety has to be a major priority across the board for staff and patients from all causes at all times. Some of the most common occupational risks to perioperative nurses are listed here. I'm sure everyone watching this video will have first or second hand experience with every hazard on the list in this slide. Maintenance and improvement in staff safety with regards to these other occupational risks can be made a bit easier by using the same safety framework of the hierarchy of controls as discussed above. Let's look at minimising Sharpe's injuries. In addition to Sharpe's injuries being a personal area of research interest and over a decade of advocacy work for me, the next couple of slides explains why I have chosen to use Sharpe's injuries as the example to study in this section. There are still 385,000 Sharpe's injuries occurring annually in US hospitals. It is no wonder that the 2013 Public Citizen Report described healthcare as a high hazard industry. And despite all the education on Sharpe's injuries and staff safety, it is estimated that 50% of staff still don't report their injuries. Please have a quick look at the pie chart indicating where Sharpe's injuries occur inside the hospital. Viewers will not be surprised to realise that most, in fact, not far short of half of all Sharpe's injuries occur in the operating room. What is even more worrying than the total number of injuries and the high percentage of all injuries occurring in the operating room is the fact that the trend is going up, not down, as, in, as is the case in the rest of the hospital. Going down 31.6% in the hospital, but up 6.5% in the operating room. The main culprits in the OR are suture needles and then scalpel blades. A published study conducted in a large Brisbane hospital showed that for every 100,000 suture needles you buy, 32 are involved in a Sharps injury. For scalpel blades, there are 12.6 injuries for every 100,000 purchased. Interestingly, this is almost five times higher than the 2.65 injuries per 100,000 needles and syringes purchased. As you can see in this slide, the consequences of scalpel injury can be broadly categorised into three groups. Uncomplicated cuts, injuries requiring surgical repair, and injuries leading to bloodborne infections. However, as part of my research and advocacy work, we came to realise that some of the dissonance we confronted from many institutions when they were asked if they'd had any scalpel blade injuries was due to a difference in definitions. Often the uncomplicated cut was subconsciously dismissed as not being a real injury. Even though I, like most people, focused on the more serious consequences such as severing a digital artery nerve or tendon 
or contracting HIV or hepatitis C. It is actually the high volume, uncomplicated, simple cuts that add up to cost the hospitals the most money. These simple cuts also carry a big impact on the well-being of the staff affected and often the patients they are treating. So now that we have reminded ourselves of the size and seriousness of this long-term Sharps injury problem, as promised, we will use the hierarchy of controls for safety framework to look at the best ways of reducing and preventing these hazards. Firstly, elimination is obviously the best way of reducing Sharps injuries when it's a possibility. By way of examples, non-essential IV and IM injections need to be stopped. The medications need to be given as oral or transdermal formulations as soon as feasible. And for appropriate wounds, glue should be used in preference to sutures. Substitution is another excellent way of reducing Sharps injuries. Examples include the almost universal introduction of needle-free intravenous access systems, and surgeons should use blunt-tipped suture needles for closing muscle and fascia in surgery. However, in most cases, elimination or substitution of sharp is not physically possible, such as the need for scalpels to be used in surgery. In these cases, we need to look at the next level or levels of the hierarchy of controls to determine the best ways to prevent these injuries, starting with engineering controls. As was explained earlier, engineering controls are designed to further protect people from the hazard by creating a change to the worker's environment rather than relying wholly on changing the worker behaviour. Engineering controls to prevent Sharps injuries and cuts include devices that are specifically designed with a safety feature to protect the user from injury. An example would be a single-handed scalpel blade remover. By contrast, hemostats, Kelly grips and needle holders are not designed to remove scalpel blades. Despite their frequent use for this task, they are not considered to be an engineering control and should not be used. Other examples of engineering controls include retractable syringes and Sharps disposal units that comply with relevant regulations and standards. By way of a quick update on this important topic, recent studies have shown that all safety devices used as engineering controls are not equal. According to these studies, safety devices can be categorised into two groups, the more effective passive or automatic safety devices and the less effective active or manual safety devices. So how can one distinguish between these two types of safety devices? The superior passive or automatic safety device is defined as a device in which the safety feature is automatically activated without the need for extra action by the user. Examples include spring-loaded retractable syringes and single-handed scalpel blade removers. The less effective active or manual safety devices are those devices that require the user to manually activate the safety feature, leaving room for human error to negate the potential safety benefit. Examples include syringes with an extra barrel or sheath to cover the needle and safety scalpels. A recent study by Decini et al. showed that the passive or automatic safety devices are up to 70 times safer. They were involved in 70 times fewer injuries than the active or manually operated safety devices. Hence, it is really important that you look for passive safety devices as part of your Sharps safety program. The next step is administrative controls. Examples include writing policies, such as for Sharp safety, hopefully referring to AORN's Sharp safety guidelines. Standardising compliance with safe work practices including routine use of hands-free passing techniques, banning recapping of syringes, and of course, obligatory routine Sharps injury reporting. Ensuring staff are adequately trained in safe work practices and the use of engineering controls. The training can now be done online with videos and new interactive training apps. Also, implementation rates can be monitored with safety score audits of purchasing data. By way of an example, 
let's say the hospital decides to implement scalpel beta removers as an engineering control. What administrative controls can be implemented to support this? Training sessions for the relevant staff should increase awareness about the importance of sharp safety, current regulations and best practices, as well as simply on how to use the products correctly. Training should, where possible, incorporate new ways of training on these devices that some manufacturers now provide, such as how to use videos combined with interactive app-based training. This new innovation now means training can be done 24 hours a day. Perfect for times of lockdown during a pandemic and in normal times, perfect for shift workers. We can also incorporate the scalpel blade removers as part of the standard operating procedures and equipment checklists to ensure better compliance. We can then have a purchasing order to use purchase data as a proxy to measure usage. So I will repeat myself, administrative controls are essentially there to ensure staff actually implement the hierarchy of control solutions that have been agreed upon. Their value should not be underestimated. Personal protective equipment, or PPE, is probably the most universally identified way of keeping staff safe. However, it sits at the bottom of the upside down pyramid for a reason. It is the least effective way of protecting staff from injuries. Examples of PPE for staff when handling sharps include double gloving and protective footwear. As we have seen before, PPE is the option of last resort and the last line of defence. The first four levels need to be given greater importance and need to be implemented in conjunction with PPE, not replaced by PPE. This section illustrates that the more effective protective measures to prevent sharps injuries to healthcare workers and downstream hospital staff, namely the higher levels of control, are rarely fully implemented in a hospital. And as a result, we still have 385,000 preventable sharps injuries annually. Scalpel injuries have recently been referred to as the forgotten sharps injury. And this hazard is an example of how most hospitals have relied too heavily on level five, namely PPE, and ignored the more effective higher level, number three, engineering controls, in particular, passive safety devices. We will now look at the third and final systematic approach to reduce and prevent hazards, namely by supporting both staff and patient safety culture. Investing in staff safety is important for two reasons. In its own right, as an ethical prerogative, and because this has also been shown to have a positive flow on effect for patient safety. For this reason, we have been advocating for many years for healthcare to adopt one single safety culture for both staff and patients. So why do organisations ignore staff safety? This slide shows a number of reasons or excuses why at an organisational level we continue to ignore staff safety. Leadership's commitment to staff safety is still much less than their commitment to patient safety, even though the focus should be on one safe culture for everyone. As a result, inadequate resources are provided for your safety. The hierarchical and traditional nature of healthcare makes change very difficult to instigate. There is often no transparent, comprehensive analysis to manage staff safety risks, but hopefully the widespread adoption of the hierarchy of controls framework will address this issue. Inadequate communication of staff safety issues is something you can start fixing today, if not tomorrow. Report your injuries. The complex training systems are issues that can be improved with new technologies such as interactive digital training apps. Another factor that is not often discussed is that the current purchasing practices limit purchasing to large group buying organisations and large prime vendors. As part of this cost-cutting philosophy, innovation is being stifled. One negative consequence of limiting access to industry representatives to hospitals 
is that clinical input into purchasing decisions is being stifled. We all know that the cheapest product is not always the best product for a particular job. In fact, the cheapest product is not always the cheapest product in the long run. And in certain circumstances, industry representatives can play an important role in developing clinician-led innovation. Now let's look at why we, why you and I, tend to ignore staff safety at an individual level. My research colleagues and I have observed and published three key reasons why a clinician may ignore his or her own safety. Firstly, denial. While we may be aware that the risk of contracting HIV from an infected patient is one in 300, and for hepatitis C, much higher, one in 30, we all somehow assume that the infection will happen to someone else and not to us personally. Secondly, self-sacrifice. If you or I take a risk with our own safety for the benefit of our patients, we somehow feel like an even better person. In this cartoon, we see a child crying, not sick, and definitely not dying. The man on the left rushes across hot coals in bare feet, almost certainly injuring himself badly. The lady on the right is smarter. She knows that the child is only crying, so she puts on her shoes before she walks across the hot coals to console the child. Both are safe. Thirdly, and most worryingly, is that when we are injured, we all too often blame ourselves. This in part explains why 50% of all Sharps injuries still go unreported, and it also means that after an injury, we don't look at ways to prevent it recurring. A couple of years ago, I looked after one of our registrars who suffered a Sharps injury. He looked a bit embarrassed and said to me, it was my fault I wasn't concentrating meaning he would never have another Sharps injury because he would never lose concentration again. This is an impossibility, especially in a hectic ED. Now, if we, the at-risk staff, don't speak up about our own safety, how do you think management is going to know that these hazards exist and how could we expect them to do something about preventing them? If there can be such a thing, the silver lining from this past horrific 12 to 18 months has been the public spotlight on the need to keep healthcare workers safe. There have been protests all over the world to ensure governments allocated sufficient PPE. And the World Health Organization made their 2021 theme for World Patient Safety Day, keep health workers safe to keep patients safe. A quotation from this 2020 article in The Lancet states it clearly. There now needs to be universal recognition that health workers' safety is patient safety. One cannot exist without the other. This is true for respiratory infections, Sharps injuries, exposure to surgical plume and musculoskeletal injuries. We need to act now. We need to cement staff safety as a core goal in every hospital. I would like to pause again for the second of our three thought experiments. I would like you to spend a few moments Hit pause if you need longer and consider what changes you have recognised in the attitude towards staff safety personally, from your colleagues and from a community perspective. From the perspective of the general public, I have noticed mixed messaging. On the one hand, demands for staff to have access to PPE to keep them safe. But on the other hand, the near idolisation of the heroic risk-taking behaviour exhibited by many staff. I fear the latter reinforces our clinical staff's reflex prioritisation of patient safety above their own. We have been advocating for many years for healthcare to adopt one single safety culture for both staff and patients, because this will create a symbi symbiotic relationship with improvements in one resulting in improvements in the other. That is, improving staff safety will improve patient safety and vice versa. So now let's look at what can be done to prepare for a safer future for both staff and patients. Preparation for future pandemics needs to start today, and it needs to be based on a systematic approach to hazard reduction, exploring potential solutions at all five levels of the hierarchy of controls. Development and implementation of these potential solutions must be supported, promoted, and implemented 
at these three levels, national, organisational and individual. In the next three slides, we will remind ourselves of the basic ingredients that must be followed for change to happen. I will also share with you a few out-of-the-box ideas to stimulate your own creative problem-solving skills. At a national level, we need to do a number of things. Firstly, set aside special R&D funding for solutions to problems identified by national bodies such as ARN. We need to align patient and staff safety standards, including infection control. We need to fortify early alert frameworks and allocate adequate resources and safety equipment. Increasing public awareness for staff and patient safety would be a bit like taking out an insurance policy against new political expediency, leading to a loss of focus and investment in this prevention program. Now for some out-of-the-box suggestions. If we go back to the beginnings of the HIV pandemic, universal precautions were introduced to ensure that all patients were treated without discrimination while staff were kept safe. This meant that all patients were treated as if they were infectious. It stopped people guessing a patient status based on their looks. So if we take the same successful approach to this pandemic, it will mean that we should think differently about operating rooms. My understanding is that most ORs are positively pressure ventilated. That is, the air is blown out of the room to reduce the risk of a patient getting a wound infection. However, with a respiratory pandemic, the best OR is a negative pressure one. That is where the air is sucked in from outside the OR and then the air in the room with potential viruses is extracted to the outside of the building. This stops any virus from the patient going back out into the OR complex and infecting staff and other patients. Obviously, the ideal system would be one that could be switched between positive and negative pressure a bit like a dual cycle air conditioner can switch between heating and cooling. This new system would need to be cheap enough to become the standard for new builds as well as facility refurbishments. I'm unaware of such a system being currently available, but if we can build a new mRNA vaccine from scratch in 12 months, this should not be an insurmountable problem. What about combining telehealth with robotics? to improve the quality of information shared between clinician and patient? What about funding research using facial recognition software to enable clinical staff to select the correct N95 mask, ideally without the need for fit testing? The same information could be used to help industry design masks to accommodate for the outlier facial structures and improve fit and comfort for current users. And again, I have to stress that the world's best ideas are of no use if they are not implemented. So public national audits of hospital preparedness would prevent apathy taking hold after the worst of the pandemic is over. National checklists for accreditation audits by the likes of the Joint Commission could be updated. Some major cultural thinking processes need to change at an organisational level to prevent a recurrence of the devastation of this pandemic. I trust the information presented in this talk has convinced you that one of the first steps needs to be organisations investing in higher levels of control measures to prevent over-reliance on PPE. And this should go hand in hand with analysing risks for both staff and patients, both current risks and predicted future risks. Increasing compliance with reporting of hazards and injuries and ensuring this data is more closely analysed and acted upon. Increasing the conduct of root cause analyses and again ensuring the timely implementation of corrective actions. It has to be a practical exercise, not simply an academic or worse still, a tick and flick exercise. The results of the investigation and the corrective actions must be clearly communicated with the clinical teams. Setting regular time to review innovations from both inside and outside healthcare. Now, for some out of the box suggestions. We need to reverse the hurdles put in place to stop small inventors and manufacturers 
having access to key staff and fair access to purchasing agreements. This will unlock innovation. We need to adopt safety score audits and use purchasing data as a proxy measure of usage and compliance with safety processes and procedures. For example, the number of safety devices purchased and the volume of hand washing liquids purchased as a measure of their respective usage. Higher hand washing compliance can be facilitated by using colour coding and positioning of the different solutions to ensure one is using the correct solution for the correct purpose. That is soap, not hand lotion, for hand washing. In fact, there is an Australian standard, AS 1071, 2015, Placement and Presentation of Hand Hygiene Materials in Relation to the Basin in Healthcare Settings that can be adopted today. This would ensure consistency within individual wards and across facilities. While acknowledging that hospitals have suffered large negative financial impacts during this pandemic, it is also necessary to understand that ideas to help the next pandemic will have a place in clinical practice today. And in this way, they will start to offset the investment in innovative ideas and practices. For example, investment in better temperature scanners would allow for permanent entry temperature monitoring to occur, preferably into the hospital per se, but at the least into specialised areas such as an oncology ward. Ask yourself, why is a febrile visitor or staff member more important in a non-clinical area today during the pandemic than an infectious febrile patient in an oncology ward tomorrow? At an individual level, you need to speak up about problems you encounter and potential solutions you come up with. The national level can fund the R&D, legislate the introduction of change and publish audits of progress. The organisation can fund your safety devices, audit compliance with stipulated behaviour changes, and make participation more engaging and rewarding for you. But I think it's up to you and I to take our safety seriously and to use the safety devices provided. As the saying goes, management can lead us to water, but they can't make us drink it. Let me relate a story to explain this better. In response to notification from an ambulance about an incoming trauma, we would immediately organise a trauma team to manage the patient on their arrival. All too often, if on a quick inspection the patient appeared to be okay, with only minor injuries, the team would dissipate, and the investigations and management of the patient would slow down. Whilst this might have been okay for that patient, it doesn't make sense from a systems perspective. I would explain this to our young residents and registrars by stating that a 100 metre sprinter with aspirations of competing in the Olympics does not run slow 100 metre sprints during practice. For trauma patients, we still need to treat the ones with only minor injuries with the same speed and teamwork so that when a critically injured patient arrives, we know what to do and we would be practised at delivering that professional care. Likewise, you and I can't take our own safety lightly today, be it from sharps injuries, surgical plume or back injuries, and then expect to magically step up and take our safety more seriously when the next pandemic occurs. We need to change our attitude and prioritise our own staff safety today. We need to utilise evidence-based practice, participate in risk analysis investigations when they are reviewing both poor patient outcomes and, and when reviewing staff injuries. Take part in emergency preparedness and response practice, as well as occupational health training related to current hazards. And you need to speak up about problems you encounter and the solutions you come up with. As the saying goes, necessity is the mother of all invention. Now, an out-of-the-box suggestion linked to a confession. I found desktop drills for disaster preparedness a bit unrealistic and a bit unrewarding. Hospital fire training PowerPoints were just downright boring. However, I am aware that the global gaming market is worth over $160 billion. The young console jockeys can land a 747 and fly drones into foreign war zones.
maybe, just maybe, a realistic, engaging emergency preparedness and response scenario or two could be written into a game-like file map for staff training. It would probably also identify areas of improvements in the policies and guidelines used in the game. Both would mean that the next pandemic could be managed faster, safer and less expensively. I'd like to finish this section by stating the obvious. The future starts today. Paying off the cost of preparing for the next pandemic will also start today. For example, reducing less famous respiratory infections will reduce nosocomial infection in patients and sick leave among staff. By preventing these now, the money saved will start to cover the cost of long-term investment in prevention. I would like to pause for the last time for our third thought experiment. I would like you to ask yourselves to estimate how long the improved hand washing rates lasted after the SARS pandemic back in 2002. My understanding was that it was less than two years. One recent study in this pandemic has found that it has only taken four months for hand washing rates to return to the pre-pandemic baseline for this COVID-19 pandemic. Sadly, singing happy birthday has been rapidly replaced with the old rinse and run. With your answer in mind, what do you think we need to do differently this time to ensure better long-term staff and patient safety? And just as importantly, what are you going to do about it? I would like to thank my co-authors, Dr. Chimindika Conora, who has a PhD in biotechnology, and Meryn Monteith, who has a degree in communication. I'm sure you would agree that that's a pretty good combination of skills and experience. Please see my email address. I invite you to write to us with your feedback, questions, and ideas on how we can make the future safer for ourselves and our patients. Thank you for your time.